where did this idea come up? Obviously, uh, we have been uh, a part of uh, sexual harassment committees, procedure making for quite a long time. If you look at the, the Sue Gender team, they've been very busy writing procedures, uh, policies, and thinking about how to institutionalize uh, these issues. But our concerns increased, I have to say, um, especially because sexual harassment and gender-based violence uh, increased on campus and overall during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So we are really uh, sort of uh, reflecting our concerns or uh, trying to respond to our concerns over these issues in the last couple of months. Uh, the, the, the pandemic was definitely a different period as it uh, confined many of us to our homes. We had to find, however, digital ways of increasing solidarity and enhancing our networks. And we thought that this webinar series would be a wonderful opportunity for us to start uh, building international networks. So um, what you may have noticed from the title of the uh, general series is that we want to look at research, action plans, so action, but also narrativization. We thought that we would like to bring a network of scholars, policymakers, together with artists, writers, uh, playwrights, filmmakers, to reflect on se sexual harassment and gender-based violence. We don't want it to just remain in a sphere where it's only scholars or, who are talking, or it's only uh, policymakers who are, who are talking. We actually would like the representation and the writing of these issues to be problematized and incorporated into our discussions. So as I said, our first speaker two weeks ago was Heike Pantelman. Uh, she referred to many issues, which I won't be able to summarize in a very short uh, sort of presentation, but just a few words. She talked about the German context. Uh, she talked about, of course, uh, the university and especially this uh, problematic taboo around the university as an enlightened institution, which uh, impedes uh, many uh, sort of participants or many actors in the university from seeing it as a space where sexual harassment is possible or can take place. So she really talked about this big taboo that really needs to be criticized and uh, revised in order to open up to a space for self-critique and uh, acceptance of harassment. She also uh, conducted many surveys on campus. She works at the Free University of Berlin and talked about misperceptions around uh, sexual harassment, which was also quite interesting because even though the uh, cases are rampant, students and scholars and professors and administrators alike basically said this is really irrelevant or not interesting. So her findings from those surveys were actually quite interesting. And uh, last but not least, uh, she was very critical of not only her own institution, but of uh, German uh, higher education. And I think this really set the tone for our series. I mean, we, we are here obviously coming from different uh, university contexts, but we are not in any way trying to protect or to defend our institutions, we're here trying to find solutions, we're trying to uh, sort of uh, write and uh, implement action plans. So it's really important to uh, sort of have a high case tone, I would say, overall uh, throughout the series of self-critique and uh, acknowledgement of problems with sincerity. So I think uh, we have built a wonderful network here where most of us want to get in touch with the others just because we are able to uh, connect uh, at this very sincere level. So uh, coming very quickly uh, to our speaker today, uh, Elizabeth Armstrong uh, is a professor of sociology at the University of Michigan. She joined the faculty in 2009. And it's her alma mater. Uh, she actually graduated uh, from the University of Michigan with a double degree in sociology and computer science. So she has a really fascinating background bringing together the sciences and the social, the natural and the uh, social sciences. Um, she, her research uh, is on reproduction of gender, class and race inequalities. And she examines these processes in the domain of sexuality and within the organizational context of the university, which I think will be really relevant to our uh, discussion today. Uh, 
Uh, I've uh, talked to her uh, in length and I know her uh, presentation and I have to say uh, she really weaves the U.S. higher education context into American uh, history extremely well. She's going to refer to Title IX, which is obviously something we need to talk about, um, and how uh, sexual harassment was added on to Title IX as a violation. And she's also going to make references to the Me Too movement, and her approach is going to be uh, intersectional. So you'll see how she weaves together these uh, seemingly disparate histories and uh, politics um, in, a, in a very uh, um, fascinating way. The title of her talk is very provocative, I think, and I think it attracted a lot of attention. Uh, sexual harassment and violence in the US higher education context, lots of harm, lots of process and little accountability. So without further ado, I will give the word to Elizabeth. Welcome and we look very much forward to your talk. Thank you for accepting to join us today. Yes, thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen now. Um, uh, let's see, so this, did this work? No, <laughs> not for uh, me at least. Not yet, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, perfect. Am I, am, I, am I shared? Yes. Okay. Well, I so much appreciate this, this invitation um, to, to give this presentation. So thank you, Julia, and, um, and everybody for, um, for coming. I think it's late in the evening there, so I very much appreciate, appreciate your time. And I'm so glad that I was able to see Dr. Pantelman's presentation a couple weeks ago um, the, to give me a sense of like, you know, where, where to start from and how to kind of build on the conversation. I found it extremely interesting. And I will try to make a few comparisons in terms of numbers, although that's quite tricky, and also kind of pick up on this theme that we started talking about um, last time a little bit about process. There's this kind of problem that we can't get accountability for this harm that occurs if there's no way to report it and no way to process it, but that um, a lot of the processes, at least that exist um, in the US are extremely problematic. Um, somebody in the chat brought up um, uh, Dr. Sarah Ahmed's work. And so I went and read some of it and was like blown away and kind of incorporate some of that in this discussion, this kind of, this kind of how, um, how, how do we kind of think about complaint and symbolic versus substantive managing of complaints? So I'll get, I'll get to that. So this kind of themes about how to kind of manage this violence. But so my, um, the um, outline of the presentation today, um, will I'll, I'll, it'll be in three sections. Um, and I will try to keep each to about 20 minutes and then we'll stop for questions at each. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the US context and then move to kind of definitions and prevalence and then move to kind of institutional responses. So that's sort of how I will proceed. Um, in terms of the US context, I'll talk a little bit about the political context, um, the um, legal context, and I wanted to highlight particularly because we, we we're talking about the German context last time, really the residential nature of US higher education, which has a lot of um, consequence for student, student sexual assault in the US. So starting with the political context, um, I wanna highlight this wonderful book by Estelle Friedman, a historian at Stanford, Redefining Rape, Sexual Violence in the Era of Suffrage and Segregation. She um, goes back and does a, basically a history of rape in the US and point, pointing out that basically sexual violence is um, part of and intimately woven into American history with slavery as a defining origin kind of trauma um, crime of, um, of the US. I mean, this is this, this slavery meant that men who were slave owners owned both um, the men and the women. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the way marriage was understood, their wives as well. And so the, the violence was one of the, including sexual violence was one of the entitlements of that. 
And as um, we also know, um, false allegations of rape by white women were um, adjust used as a justification for lynching. So this goes deep into the political culture of the US. And Estelle Friedman argues basically that the way we understand rape helps determine who is entitled to sexual and political sovereignty and who may exercise fully the rights of American citizenship. So, so she's, she's looking at, she looks at what kinds of non-consensual sex are actually seen as criminal or not legitimate. That from a starting point, um, many individuals didn't actually own their own bodies or have kind of entitle, entitlement to any kind of autonomy. And that, that still um, shapes the, um, the political context now. I mean, um, the, as I'll talk about, um, you know, l later just, I mean, well, Trump and kind of um, elite white men who seem to be appalled at being kind of held accountable for sexual violence prior to that I think is in the context that there was an assumption of en entitlement to women's bodies, particularly the bodies of women of color. And in that context, I mean, um, which is often kind of lost to history, is it's actually in the US context, actually African-American women have been the um, early ad forerunners of anti-sexual violence activism in the US. For example, in this case, um, Resi Taylor, a woman, uh, a 24-year-old black mother and sharecropper, was um, raped by six white men in the 40s. And Rosa Parks and the NAACP attempted to get justice for her, not successfully. But this this is kind of showing that the, 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 the um, and, and this, this isn't even the first wave of, of, of this kind of activism, but that it was stemming from um, Black women, um, which has been also true in the contemporary Me Too movement that, that was founded by Tarana Burke. Um, and then um, in the more recent moments when kind of elite white women picked it up, it, became, it exploded and became more global. And the kind of origins of the of the movement with Toronto Burke were were reclaimed at, at that at that point. Um, so this is this this so so sexual violence is is kind of entangled with the um, the kind of trauma of the of the U.S. U.S. political project, and as such, it's become intensely partisan now. And so it's very visible. It's very partisan. Um, Here's a picture of, um, of Joe Biden, now our uh, Democratic um, presidential you know, nominee um, candidate. And this, as, when, as vice president, he was extremely involved in um, addressing violence against women. Um, as some of you may know, he's also now been accused of sexual harassment and even assault himself. Um, so very much entangled in the kind of, in the dominant kind of political debate. Um, the, the, the second picture here, Brett Kavanaugh, who's now on the Supreme Court last year was um, accused of um, sexually assaulting one of his high school classmates, um, Christine Blasey Ford. I had the lovely pleasure of meeting her last year and she, she's, she is genuinely an astonishingly amazing human being. Um, and she knew what she was doing in the US political context by coming forward that it was like essentially stepping in front of a train um, because of the amount of um, retaliation that, it, that occurs. At the time I spoke with her, she was still, I think, not able to live back in her house and still had security and couldn't, and her whereabouts needed to be fairly concealed. So this is, this is high, massively political. Um, and this degree of partisanness actually also extends to the politicization of campus sexual assault as well. In the Obama administration, I think largely um, kind of imp under uh, President, Vice President Biden's emphasis, emphasis, President Obama placed the spotlight on campus sexual assault. Um, and uh, they had this It's On Us campaign, lots of visibility about it, which of course, because President Trump has decided that anything Obama <laughs> did has to be um, um, basically rescinded or rolled back, um, his um, Department of Education Secretary, Betsy DeVos, has spent an enormous amount of energy rolling back um, those, those efforts of the Obama administration and it just recently re released new rules on campus sexual assault. I'll get to this again 
later, but, um, but the, in terms of the issue of process and rules, these new rules that Betsy DeVos released are 2,300 pages. So just to kind of get that in the mind of like, there's 30 pages of them are actually like what schools have to do, but this is in the US context, um, this has become an enormously legally elaborated, kind of politically contested, kind of high visibility domain. Um, so to move on to the legal context, um, this is, I was very struck um, kind of last session when um, Dr. Panzelman indicated that there in Germany, there actually isn't a specific law against sex discrimination in education. Um, we can, you, she can correct me if I misunderstood that, but that, but that I just really wanted to emphasize that one of the kind of interesting things about the U.S. case is that, is that almost by accident, sex discrimination in education did become like a civil rights violation, and also just the incredible complexity of the, the legal environment, which makes actually simply trying to follow all of these rules um, for schools who are earnestly trying to do so quite a challenge. So the text of Title IX reads, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Given that virtually every um, educational program receives federal financial assistance in some form, that's all of them. This applies K through 12 and the entire post-secondary sector. Um, the history of Title IX, the 50 year anniversary is coming up. There'll be a number of books coming out, but this was enormously um, influential in um, moving towards gender equity in education in the US. Many people know that this was um, very much associated with kind of more equality in athletics, but, um, and it's, I mean, a very short, very short law. Um, so this notion that it applies to sort of sexual harassment and sexual violence in schools was not immediately apparent. And in fact, it, it, had, it was a political legal process to get it to apply. Catherine McKinnon, um, very famous legal scholar um, in the late 70s and early 80s, in a, particularly in a case at Yale, a now famous course case, Alexander versus Yale, that case established that sexual, it was both defining sexual harassment as a thing and then establishing it as a Title IX violation. So that kind of created a legal framework that in fact, it's a problem if um, individuals are, are denied access to schooling based on sexual harm in the environment and makes schools responsible for, at least theoretically, for providing a safe, a safe context for, for um, people to go to go to school. Um, there's been enormous amount of legal elaboration of this. I'm not going to go into all of the nitty gritty on this, but suffice it to say that that over time, the the meanings of Title IX and the the complexity of federal um, uh, kind of laws have um, increased. And so here again, the new regulations, 2,300 pages. Um, but that's just at the federal level. Like every single U.S. state has different rape statutes, and the states are now increasingly passing specific laws that cover campus sexual assault. So there, that means that what um, there's affirmative consent laws in California and New York, but not in other states. I mean, so there's just an enormous kind of um, patchwork of different uh, different. Um, laws that, and that need to be applied, you know, uh, complied with. And then schools are actually then sued also by individuals. And then uh, those decisions actually end up being binding and set precedent in, in um, kind of various regions in the, in the U.S. So this is, there's just a, a legal morass, basically, which leads to um, this kind of a general process. I just want to draw your attention to this book, relatively new book by Lauren Edelman, a socio-legal scholar, Working Law, um, which is her, her case is mostly um, EEOC, that is like workplace civil rights um, 
kind of cases, not so much educational cases, but she talks about the legal of organizations as the process through which elements of law and legal principles become relevant to organizations and motivate the infusion of law-like ideas and creation of law-like structures into, into organization governments. In other words, there's a kind of reproduction of the whole kind of legal and increasingly like even criminal kind of um, edifice within, within American universities. Um, and there's um, a, a sociologist, Chiki Ramirez, an institutionalist at Stanford that is interested in looking at legalization of universities globally. He does a lot of, kind of global comparative work and is interested in sort of the, this, general, this general process, but it's gone very far in the, in the US case. So that's point two. Point three on the particularities is really the residential nature of US higher education. Now, it is not the case that all uh, students um, attending college, um, you know, live in dorms or whatever. Like, so here's the percentage living with parents. And you could see that at public two years, that's the American community colleges, more students live at home. Private nonprofits, that's like Harvard. Those are the really elite schools. Um, that's the fewest students live at home. But in all cases, it's, it's less than half um, are living at home. And if they're living on campus, some, a lot are living in these giant like residence halls. And so you can, in, in this case, it's like often very privileged young people who have been kind of um, very sheltered, um, who have very low levels of experience with kind of taking care of themselves, um, very limited ability to self-regulate. Um, some of them have never woken themselves up to, you know, get to school or made a meal for themselves or cleaned up after themselves or dumped into these residence halls with like often more than a thousand 18 year olds in the same building. It's just a terrible idea, actually. Um, it's just, it's, it's, uh, I don't know exactly why it's so um, taken for granted and kind of reified in the American context that this particular kind of residential higher education is a good idea, but it's, it's, it's very much um, a, a thing. Um, and then on top of that, um, students um, participate in fraternities and sororities. When, I've, when I have given presentations to um, European academics, um, often the bizarreness of the American fraternity and sorority system is something that tends to kind of come up like that the fact that that the US that many US universities sponsor essentially exclusive social clubs for wealthy white students who want to engage in um, extreme um, partying um, and hazing and often you know killing each other and sexually assaulting each other are officially sponsored by many universities it's again bizarre um and these but these um uh people in congress men in congress often came through the fraternity system these are often the wealthiest alumni of universities they own these properties right on the campuses they're very, very hard to dislodge and they're very dangerous spaces. And so all of this together basically means that the American college peer culture creates just incredible opportunities for student student assault. Um, that this, I mean, and, and then it creates an incredible controversy over who's responsible for all of these assaults. Um, that was one of the things that was kind of battled over in the new Betsy DeVos, um, Title IX regulations, like which, which assaults are universities responsible for. These fraternities have managed to come up with amazing like insurance plans that somehow mysteriously pass on the liability for this behavior onto the parents. Often the parents don't understand this when they allow their kids to join these organizations. But it's, it's basically a minefield of bad behavior and, um, and, and sexual assault is only one part of it, but it is, it is, it is kind of bizarre. Um, so I guess I'll pause there. That's the kind of end of, of the end of the, the first part and I'm on time, so that's good. And so maybe I'll stop there and, you know, see if there are some questions at this point.
yeah. So I, I guess, um, is the question um, we aggregator? Can, if you wish, Elizabeth, and we'll take the questions in the second round. Okay, should we, should I just keep going? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. I can, I can just keep going. Okay. Um, so next section, um, definitions and prevalence. So I'm going to talk both about sexual harassment of faculty and staff um, and sexual assault of undergraduate students by peers. Um, in the US context, these are quite distinct um, things because I think in part because of the particularities of how student-student sexual assault kind of works out because of the residential nature of universities. For the discussion of the um, sexual harassment piece of it, I. I use slides by my wonderful colleague, Lilia Cortina, who um, is um, an expert on um, uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment of, of, fa of faculty and staff. And she was one of the participants in this um, um, fairly new report that the US government has just put out, or rather the National Academies of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I'm not sure if it's a government report, but anyway, the, that, that, that this was a very, very influential report published in um, 2018, just a couple years ago. Um, it was um, brought together 21 people of sexual harassment experts, scientists, engineers, physicians, legal scholars, college presidents, a former congresswoman, all these people were brought together to review the state of knowledge on sexual harassment of women in STEM and came up with this, this, this report, which is then um, motivating. It's being used now for um, a kind of collaborative action committee of all of these various different universities are coming together trying to implement the um, recommendations of this report. So it's actually quite exciting. And um, I was gonna say this at the beginning, but I, I certainly, this, this report is publicly available. And I, I, I started a Google doc with all the references for, um, that I used to prepare this. And I can, I can um, it's kind of a mess now, but I can make that available. But this is definitely um, a very, very interesting document. Um, so, they define, um, based on the, uh, the standard psychological social science definition of sexual harassment, um, sexual harassment is behavior that derogates, demeans, or humiliates an individual based on the individual's sex. So they divide that up into three different components of it. Um, the sexual coercion part, which is basically the kind of um, sleep with me or you're fired or, or, you know, exchange of sex for a grade in the academic context um, or for a letter of recommendation or, you know, uh, access to, you know, working in a good lab or something like that, that um, that's the kind of thing that people often think most about. Also, unwanted sexual attention, um, unwanted touching, groping, forcible kissing, pressure for dates, um, and and the like. It can include sexual assault, but it doesn't necessarily need to. And then also gender harassment, which is basically um, behavior that conveys hostility, exclusion, or second class status. Um, something, even something like, well, I really don't think that, you know, since, since, your, since your baby was born, you haven't really been paying as much attention to, you know, your work. I mean, those things like that would fall under under this as as well. Um, so anything that makes um, an individual feel like they do not belong in the academic context because of their sex, that they're not as smart as because they're, you know, a woman or things like that. So these, um, um, the often, the, the point though, even kind of in the US context that a lot of the this kind of gender harassment isn't necessarily illegal, but um, one of uh, the contributions of Lilia Cortina's work um, is that she has shown that, um, that this kind of gender harassing behavior has tremendously negative consequences for um, individuals who are on the receiving end of it in educational and workplace con uh, contexts. 
Um, and here's another way of kind of representing it. This is also Lilia Cortina's um, uh, a diagram that, that we often think about just the kind of what she calls the come-ons, the coerced sex, the sexual assault professor, professor for dates as the problem. And she's saying, she's like saying it's like an iceberg. There's all of this stuff kind of below the waterline and it's all kind of connected, like professional sabotage, um, infantilization, um, all of these kinds of things that, that, that occur in educational and workplace contexts that, that communicate that um, someone is less than. And then she, she, the, they've also found out too, which I think this is very interesting. So this is um, a um, um, survey of incident rates at a large public university in the, in the Midwest. 37% of female faculty and staff didn't experience any harassment, but that means that two thirds did basically. And that, and that most of it was gender harassment or gender harassment and these other behaviors. In other words, gender harassment is the kind of underlying uh, thing on which the other the coercion and unwanted sexual attention also arises, is the, is which suggests that the come-ons are really another form of, of pushing out, right? Because sometimes people who have a misperception about this kind of sexual attention in the workplace they think it's oh you know you know your professor just really thinks you're hot that's legitimate no it's 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 another way it tends to go with um, and be part of um, an, a general kind of workplace climate that is conveying a message to you know to women or or to LGBT individuals that they don't belong so. Um, so it's very it's it's rare to get the unwanted sexual attention and nothing else. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. And then this is this is this is looking at students. So of course students students are at the receiving end of peer peer sexual assault, but students are also in the position of receiving sexual harassment from faculty or staff. And so this I think is this diagram is a little complicated to kind of. Um, to unpack, but I mean the basic the basic line you know story is that overall there's more of this behavior in medicine and engineering and than it is in non-STEM, and so that's that's um, kind of consistent with the story that it's it's disciplines that are more male dominated, they're more masculinely identified, where women are less welcome, where uh, where this behavior tends to be the most serious, particularly the gender harassment. The, the amounts of um, kind of um, unwanted sexual attention and sexual coercion are not that different across the different fields, but the gender harassment is extremely heightened in these uh, these highly male dominated fields. Um, and so kind of the, the kind of bottom line with um, respect to this is that gender harassment is the most um, common form of sexual harassment. And then I didn't show um, details on this, but LGBTQ women and women of color experience more of this harassment. There's this sort of intersectional dimension, which that connects back to um, the kind of intersectional aspect of this at the beginning of, of the talk, that this is not separate from um, other forms of inequality um, or racial inequality that, and often, um, the kind of forms of harassment that um, women of color experience is it ha often has a both of a racialized and a gendered component um, that that it's like was was I being harassed because I'm a woman of color or was I being harassed because I'm a woman or what's the nature of that and so it ends up often also being hard to address in terms of if there's a policy about race and a policy about gender but the harassment actually is like falls right square in the middle of it, which, which policy applies or kind of what, what type of violence is it um, becomes, becomes a problem. Um, yeah, and so then, of course, then this is, this is, it's not only women who are harassed in terms of the gender harassment that men experience in education is often in the form of kind of not man enough um, type of insults, right? That, that um, and that's where the homophobia would come in as well. Like that, some, that in some way, um, the, um, an individual is seen as not kind of 
measuring up to a kind of gender expectation of some sort. Um, yeah, and then um, I'll, I'll get to this more with the issue of um, the um, kind of institutional responses, but since Lilia had the slide, I kind of put this in here that that this behavior is just vastly underreported, um, particularly with the ex, um, the workplace sexual harassment um, policies. These have been robust and in place in the U.S. for quite a while, and more so, more um, earlier than student student sexual assault procedures, um, and even so you know, uh, just a just a fraction of people here, like 6% 6, 6 in 1996 and 6.4% in 2016 individuals reported. And um, the lack of reporting, you know, fear of blame, disbelief, inaction, retaliation, humiliation, ostracization, damage to career income, all of these things. And I think that I would really emphasize the issue of retaliation. Um, and, um, in an academic context, if it's, for example, if someone is in the position of needing to report their major advisor, that, as we know, can be completely career killing. Um, if that, if all of a sudden one doesn't have an advisor or the letter of recommendation one was expecting is not going to be forthcoming, um, it's just a, it, the, figuring out how to present, prevent retaliation is very hard. And, one of the things that in the US context, um, people have been trying to figure out like, okay, maybe you could protect retaliation in the particular school where the two parties work, but how do you protect, um, prevent retaliation, say in, a na in, a, in the national field in, um, when someone goes to um, a professional association or getting invited to panels and all, all kinds of things like that. So that's a, that's a, that's a very, serious, very, very serious issue and there's lots of discussion about that. Okay, so now um, I'll turn to the peer sexual assault side of it, the, the student student sexual assault. And I'll look um, at um, first the sort of origins in the US of kind of doing all of these what are now called climate surveys, these kind of surveys of campus sexual assault prevalence, look at some definitions and look at um, the kind of prevalence of, of this assault in the US. And then I thought it was really interesting, the numbers Professor Panselman um, presented last time, because actually, it, I mean, I may have misunderstood them, but in the, it appears that in the US context, this, it's just vastly worse, vastly, vastly. But we can talk about that more. Um, so Mary, Mary Koss, she's a psychologist, she's still working. Um, she, was, she was really right in the, uh, out in the cutting edge um, and really kind of alone and in, 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 in her interest in this in the 80s, she developed an instrument called the Sexual Experiences Survey, which she administered um, in, in the mid 80s to 6,000 college students in 32 institutions and the innovation was this so she didn't say did you experience rape she developed behaviorally specific questions questions were like um did someone you know um insert a, a penis or other object into your vagina um against you know without your consent like very very specific questions that were um that kind of took the loaded terms out of it because she was aware um, that a lot of people didn't would would not uh, didn't um, label experiences that legally met the definition of rape. They did not label them as rape, but they would be willing to disclose that these things had happened to them if they um, if if the questions were asked very very behaviorally. And this is where the kind of the the, the one in four number that you know is constantly thrown about in the U.S. context was originally came about and it turns out it's not wrong <laughs> and it's and it's still it's still very much the case um, so for the more recent um, um, kind of prevalence I draw on this new paper my this Lisa Fadina is now a colleague of mine here at the University of Michigan in the School of Social Work and in the journal trauma violence and abuse she and her colleagues did a kind of um, meta-analysis of 34 different studies of um, the prevalence of campus sexual assault in the U.S. 
um, from 2000 to 2015. This was published in 2018. Um, and kind of shows the sort of variation of that. And I'll show those numbers, but they, they, so they, they look at four different types of crimes against um, women in this context. So they're looking at forcible rape, um, which they're defining as forcible vaginal, anal, or oral intercourse using physical force or threat of force, incapacitated rape, um, which is completed vaginal, anal, or oral intercourse while the victim is intoxicated or on drugs, sexual coercion, which is completed unwanted sexual contact, kissing, fondling, or other sexual touching, or completed vaginal, anal, or oral intercourse through nonviolent means, such as intimidation, pressure, lies, threats to end a relationship, or continual arguments, and then also unwanted sexual contact, um, attempted or unwanted um, kissing, fondling, petting, or other sexual touching, using physical force, threat of force, verbal coercion, or, or a combination of these, but not, ex not including vaginal, anal, or oral intercourse. So lots of different types of, of, <laughs> like, of violence, but, um, but the definitions are important to kind of understand what, um, what these results are. So what, they, what she did across these 34 studies is she looked at, um, she tried to get the, to compare them in terms of the definitions they were using as carefully as possible, and then looked at the kind of lower and upper um, kind of findings and all of the, the whole range of the findings. And so, for example, um, of, of these surveys, um, and this, I think what they are, I, it was not clear in the paper whether they were looking, what the time frame they were looking at. I know that they're looking at just happened in college, um, but I, th I think the prevalence is over the four years or however long the individual had been in college. Um, but that somewhere, somewhere between 0.5 and 8% of undergraduate women in the U.S. Um, experience forcible rape while in college. Um, 1.8 to 14% incapacitated rape. Sexual coercion, 1.7 to 32%. And then unwanted sexual contact. Um, 1.8 to 34 percent, and they pointed out in the paper that most studies and found that this was over 20 percent. So this is where the kind of one in four or one in five number really comes from, and it's found over, over, and over again. Um, and to to kind of shed light on really how serious this is, is that the, these. These overarching numbers include all women, including the most privileged, the most advantaged, and all of that. And so, for uh, populations that are um, that are more at risk, these the rates are higher for sexual, gender, and racial and ethnic minorities. I was looking for a paper on international students because Huya and I had an interesting conversation about that. There actually wasn't a, to I did not find a good paper on that, but logically. Um, you know, and the hints are that international students who are studying in the U.S. are likely experiencing sexual assault in American universities, probably at higher rates than um, American students, because um, perpetrators take advantage of, um, of vulnerability and, and being far from home creates vulnerability. Um, students with disabilities are more at risk. Greek life is dangerous. Um, the first year of college, students are unfamiliar with the social scene, um, drinking heavily makes one vulnerable for incapacitated assault. And then as, as the literature shows, um, uh, prior victimization leads one to be vulnerable for additional um, victimization. Um, so so some, some of the, some groups are just are, are kind of at a, you know, astonishingly high rates of, of uh, highly, highly vulnerable in the American university context. And so, um, so there I pulled, I went back to Heike's slides and looked at what she presented last time about the German universities. And then, and from what I found, she was finding numbers of 3.3% or, or had been subject to sexual violence or 4.8% inappropriate touching or 2% sexual assault. Now, if those, if those are roughly parallel and, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that they are. I think that would be an interesting thing to discuss more, but it, it would lead me to think that, in fact, what's happening in the U.S. in terms of physical sexual violence that um, undergraduates are experiencing from their peers is, 
is really just like vastly higher. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, I'm, I'm curious to have more discussion about that. So that may be a good place to kind of um, pause because that's the, also that's the end of the kind of second part of the, the presentation. Okay, Elizabeth, you received two questions while you were speaking. Uh, okay. One participant is asking if you can clarify your criticism about the dormitories, you know, when you talked about the residences and how you thought that's a bad mm -hmm. idea. So can you expand on that? And the second question is if there is a gender, gender wage gap in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, on, on the residence halls, um, in terms of, you know, why, why, why a bad idea, just this, this notion that, um, that young people who are 17, 18 years old um, are with no experience ever living on their own are um, put in um, these contexts um, where they are, they are uh, like a thousand 18 year olds all together, often with very, very limited adult um, supervision. I mean, they're really not adults um, developmentally. Um, and so it leads to a lot of risk. Like, so this is actually based on, so I, with, my, with my collaborator, Laura Hamilton, we wrote a book um, paying for the party, how college maintains inequalities, where we had a room in one of these residence halls for a year, and we saw what the behavior was like in the in these environments. These are, these are, um, we saw, like they did think that the, the, the people who were managing the building, they would do things like lock the lounges on party weekends to make sure that the, the students didn't throw the furniture out the window. Um, they, um, the student, that the place was filthy. I mean, because the students were not, you know, mature enough to be able to clean up after themselves, or well, willing to clean up after themselves. Um, there was, you know, enormous amount of bullying in the sense of they, they would put these whiteboards on their doors and then people would write kind of negative things and slurs on that. Enormous amount of, you know, religious bullying, um, bullying by sexual orientation. Our, our floor was all white, um, but there um, is, a, um, which suggests the, the degree of racial segregation that occurs in, in, in US um, universities, but the, the, um, it would have been a kind of terrifyingly negative place for a person of color to, to be. Um, um, and I mean, I've, I'm thinking about this a lot now with the pandemic and like, this is kind of a sidebar, but the US universities are trying to decide whether to bring students back in the fall. Um, they kind of want to because of money or because of, you know, just kind of keeping, keeping, the, keeping the operation afloat. But, um, but these situations are really, really dangerous. Even, even without a pandemic going on, there's, um, 25 students sharing a bathroom, um, um, just, um, just, you know, a, a very, very limited amount of kind of adult regulation of the space. So that, that's, yeah, so that's that point. And yes, there's a large gender wage gap in the, in the U.S. I, I, um, it's something like women make something like, you know, 82 cents or something like that to the, to the dollar that men, that men make. Um, although one of the, things, I think this is a global pattern too, but that women are overrepresented in undergraduate programs. Um, the, the majority of bachelor's degrees in the US are earned by women. So there is this kind of paradox that women's ex women um, are overperforming men in higher education, but it doesn't seem to translate into returns in the labor market. That's largely, I think, because of the different fields that um, men and women go into. Um, and, and then that relates back to the kind of gender harassment. So gender harassment is one of the things that has kind of kept women out of the higher earning STEM fields. Um, so there's a kind of direct connection between the gender wage gap and what's going on in terms of the, the harassment that people are experiencing. Because if the intent is to keep women out of certain fields, um, it's one, it is one dynamic that succeeds um, in, in doing so. Thank you. Uh, a third question, uh, the participant is saying that I might have misunderstood this, but there was something you said about 
sexual harassment being included by mistake or chance. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, I think they're referring to where you said sexual discrimination in education became a support. Um, yeah, well, yeah, so there's a, you know, the, the history of that is, is, quite, is quite interesting in the sense that, in the sense that there was a lot of, I mean, a politics around um, the, um, the civil rights legislation and um, the, the inclusion of this Title IX, which is an amendment to, um, to, to a larger bill, the, the kind of a feminist activist kind of snuck it in there. And it got passed because in part, because it was so short and no one could really have anticipated the incredible meaning and far reaching implications of this. So, so had, had the politicians at the time understood exactly what it meant when they were saying that sex discrimination in education was Ill illegal or that, you know, a civil rights violation, it, it would not have passed in the US in 1972. It just kind of um, got snuck in. And, and in some of the, the histories of Title IX that will be coming out in the next year or so, they'll, they, they, the, the, um, the kind of activists that, that were very kind of influential in kind of, um, kind of bringing Title IX into, onto the floor and getting it passed, I think that, that story will be told more fully. Uh, Heike has a response about comparison with Germany. Uh, she's saying, as we don't have laws like Title IX, uh, in, as laws like Title IX in Germany, universities don't officially count cases. The numbers come from surveys. The results bring along problems, as we know from our own survey. And so she's saying, I think that the numbers are much higher. Mm hmm yeah, yeah. So that that would make sense too. That that these that this is kind of um, you know under under reporting that that this that Heike is pick, picking up here that um, that even even in anonymous surveys, people may be not reporting because one thing that's kind of interesting that's been happening in the U.S. case in the last few years after the whole Me Too explosion. Um, uh, the climate surveys are picking up more assault. So one might think that it would be going down over time, but between about 2015 and 2018, the numbers, the numbers have actually gone up. And I mean, there's a couple different explanations for that. One is that it's a Trump effect, that basically that um, having a rapist as a president basically legitimates a kind of um, an assault on, on women, or it's the fact that the kind of politicization of the issue and the Me Too movement has made that even in anonymous surveys, people being more willing to come forward with things even in these anonymous surveys as, as having happened to them. And it's probably unknowable, and it's maybe it's some com combination of, of both. Um, but um, but these, to, 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 to be clear though, just to make sure that uh, it's clear that the, these high numbers that, um, that, you know, that I reported in terms of that Elisa Fadina et al. publication, these are not numbers that have been reported officially to schools. Um, the, um, and I, I will, I'll, I'll show this a little bit more in the institutional responses, but you know, vanishingly small numbers of undergraduate students report they don't even, they're not, they don't even report um, um, kind of, uh, you know, forced rape, penetrative rape. They're not even reporting that either to the police or to the university and um, very often. So this is, so the numbers that, that I was presenting were coming from anonymous surveys, not from formal reports. Okay, Elizabeth, if you wish, I will take two more questions and then I'll, you know, we'll leave the rest of the questions to the next Q&A session. So one in English and then one I'll switch and read in Turkish. The first question is, do anti-discrimination procedures work together with anti-harassment policies in US universities or at Michigan in particular? And now I will go to the Turkish channel and read a question in Turkish. 
E, üniversitelerdeki cinsel tacizle mücadele için kadın örgütlenmeleri hakkında da bilgi rica edebilir miyim diye soruyor e, dinleyici. E, tacize karşı kadınların dayanışma içinde olabilecekleri mekanizmalar var mı? Ve tacizde bulunan erkeklerle ilgili yapılmış çalışmalar var mı? Okay. Um, yeah. So the and the, the first question um, in terms of anti discrimination and anti harassment because because um, harassment was defined in the context of a civil rights a violation and sex discrimination. The thing that um, the thing that makes um, um, sexual violence wrong and actionable in education in the US is that it's perceived as a form of discrimination. In other words, if you have the larger bucket of discrimination, and there's lots of it, there could be discrimination on race or nationality or um, pregnancy status that might come be part of sex. The thing, um, um, sex discrimination falls under that bucket. And then um, sort of sexual harassment is a form of, of sex discrimination. And then sexual assault is a form of, um, of, of sexual harassment. So, so the kind of umbrella goes discrimination, sex discrimination, sexual harassment, sexual assault in terms of how, 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 because of the sort of particularities of the legal history of which Catherine McKinnon is, is, is a major architect. Um, I mean, it's, it's how it got defined. So, so, um, so sexual assault rape is a crime in um, the kind of criminal legal context, but the thing that makes it wrong at a school is it's a form of discrimination um, in the US context. So that was that was a, a good a good question. Um, in terms of yeah mechanisms of solidarity, yeah, well, there's a lot there's a of waves of sort of of, of uh, undergraduate women survivors organize for for change. Um, and the 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 most recent kind of wave of that was around the kind of Obama administration around um, this got documentary, The Hunting Ground, and they formed a variety of organizations like Know Your Nine and, um, and all of that. And, and that, in fact, one of the things we're in the study that I'm doing that we're interested in is that seems to have, have created a massive backlash. And one of the backlash is about claiming that, in fact, there's a lot of discrimination against men on campus and trying to weaponize Title IX and use it to um, undermine feminist projects on campus. For example, um, very um, kind of high dollar funded, kind of very sort of shadowy groups um, of men's rights activists are filing Title IX complaints, trying to destroy women's centers across, um, <laughs> across the US. Um, they're, they're saying that the existence of, of anything that has woman in the title is exclusionary to men and is sex discrimination and should therefore be made illegal. They're going after any, any scholarship program that claims to be about gender. Um, and they're saying that, that when students are actually found responsible of assault, they're filing lawsuits and said that the Title IX coordinator or the people who adjudicated the case hated men and so they were biased and so the the case should be overturned um, because it was unfair um, so that's a that's a protect predictable um, type of activism that has emerged in this you know highly highly kind of contested politicized climate that we're in the kind of weaponizing of title nine um, for um, basically discriminatory purposes <laughs> This, is, this has happened with transgender um, activism too. So in the Trump administration, they think that, um, that they have a very biologically essentialist understanding of, of, of sex. And so they think that if a transgender individual, um, if, a, like a, if a, a transgender boy is allowed um, to go into, um, well, um, or I guess more the case, I think it's usually more the case of transgender uh, girls and women, if they're allowed like in um, 
you know, women's bathrooms or to compete in um, women's athletics, that that's actually a violation of the rights of cisgender um, girls and women. And, and that because, because sex is in their view unchangeable, it becomes a Title IX violation. So there's like crazy twisting of these kind of, these kind of um, politicization of, and weaponizing of these particular laws going on now. Thank you, Elizabeth. There are more questions, but if you wish, you can continue and we'll take them in the next Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and, yeah, I'll just go ahead and continue. Um, okay, so on the, the institutional responses side, I'll talk a little bit about how complaints are handled in the U.S., the failure of these process, processes around concepts of symbolic compliance and institutional betrayal, and then a little bit on like maybe how we can do better and around a notion of institutional courage. And so in the issue of how complaints are handled, this, this is very much in the context of the discussion that we had you know, a couple of weeks ago about whether you know, schools have like formal policies and procedures and whether they help. Um, one thing that is distinctive about the U.S. context is that most American colleges and universities have highly elaborated formal policies and procedures for addressing both faculty, staff, and student complaints. Sometimes they're in the same document. Some very, very often they are distinct um, documents and procedures. Like, and often we've collected. So, in my own research, we collected the student sexual misconducts of 381 different schools. These documents are a mess. They are bureaucratic, legalese, impossible to understand, incoherent. They are a complete mess, but they exist. Um, and when these, pro so of course, these, the way these processes work is that they um, rely on individuals to identify the harm and report. And so um, in, in the kind of world of kind of the socio-legal scholarship world, the, it's, um, it's better to actually change the organization to prevent the harm from occurring than putting all of the burden on harmed individuals to make complaints. Um, so, but the policies in the US are very much put the burden on the harmed individual. Um, and so, for example, the, the, um, the, the typical steps in a kind of resolution or adjudication process. Um, and this, these are kind of usually outlined over like maybe a 40 to 50 page document are kind of reporting a complaint. So specifying who receives it, some kind of initial review to determine whether the complaint is possibly a policy violation and whether it falls under the actual kind of parameters of the policy a decision about whether a formal or an informal process would be used because some schools have multiple different kinds of processes and so there's some decision about what, which, which to, to pursue. If a formal process is pursued, then there's, a, then there's an investigation often in, um, done by a Title IX um, coordinator or, a, well, not the coordinator themselves, but a, an investigator. So, at a school like Michigan now, the Title IX office will be kind of, um, you know, have multiple investigators, full-time lawyers working on investigating these cases, um, experts specifically in this domain. Um, then after the investigation happens, a, some set of people, often a different set of people than those who did the investigation, will arrive at a finding. Um, and then sometimes it's passed off to set yet a different set of people to determine a sanction. And then if anybody objects, then there's another kind of set of processes to appeal this. And so, for example, in the University of Michigan, it's probably hard to see all of this, but in the, this is the um, kind of current flow chart for the handling of, of student complaints, student sexual misconduct complaints, like flowing from the, the complainant um, reports to the Office for Institutional Equity, um, then you know, there's an investigation, that material now goes to a hearing, which as a result of lawsuits from the respondent side have become, and, and Betsy DeVos's push have become increasingly adversarial. So now I just recently talked to the director of our Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Center, and she's saying that she thinks that 
the Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Center, which is, which is responsible for support and advocacy for survivors, needs to hire an in-house prosecutor, a legal prosecutor, to prosecute these cases because respondents are hiring such fancy lawyers for these cases. Um, so they go through a hearing and then there's the kind of multiple rounds of sort of sanction and appeal, sanctions and appeals. Um, so huge number of steps. Again, this is making the point, lots and lots of process. Um, and yeah, in terms of like, then how, how does this actually, these kind of processes actually work out in practice? Well, first of all, the, the majority of cases don't end up going through these processes. So for example, at University of Michigan, only 3.6% of students who had at least one non-consensual sexual experience reported the experiences to really to anyone. This isn't even saying they went through the process. So these formal processes are actually capturing, you know, a, you know, it did just an infinitesimal number of the actual experiences. And you know, drawing on work by uh, Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan at Columbia University, where they, they wrote this amazing book, Sexual Citizens, that just came out, which was an ethnographic kind of look at student experiences there. Um, you know, one of the students, when explaining why she didn't report, said, well, one, it's ridiculous that like an investigative process, because that means that someone can like literally get a lawyer and argue against my experiences, too, it's traumatic. I mean, so she's like saying, no, you know, don't want to do it. Um, it creates conflict with peers, um, you know, um, damages the whole process. Um, can be damaging to one's own academic goals, um, basically. Um, and there's expectation that the adjudication process will be traumatic, which will, which is true and will be increasingly more so given the way things are going in the US. So they found that, um, so at Columbia, even in a context in which the university has invested heavily in improving adjudication, the process remains relentlessly difficult for students. So, you know, see, these are miserable processes. I mean, absolutely miserable. And the, and the, the, the way the Trump administration has intervened is, will make them more so. Um, and then the US ha um, has, I mean, this, this, this may be changing a little bit. This may be one of the kind of few positive things of the new kind of Trump um, era changes, but that there's a policy of mandatory reporting where in most universities, any faculty member who hears anything about um, an assault um, has to report it. So sometimes what happens is students get essentially reported on. They don't want to be involved in any kind of bureaucratic process and they get sucked into it. And as this one student said, my, my agency was totally stripped out of my hands. So to see like just at Michigan, how it kind of works out. So this is, um, so the blue at the pyramid is basically, so we see this sort of whole set of like, of like 277 things that were reported. Okay, think like this is, this is a university where there's 6, 000, more than 6,000 students in every single class. Um, and um, so, you know, lots of students, so only 277 reports. Of those, 102 were judged to be outside of the scope of the policy. In 152 cases, the claimant didn't want to pursue an investigation. Um, and and three, of, three of those were, were investigated anyway, even though the, uh, the complainant didn't want to because of the potentially the severity of, the, of what happened. There were 20 investigations. Um, six that are still pending, three that have resulted in a sanction. That is basically 1% 1, 1 of reported policy violations ended up with, it, with a sanction. In many years, not a single student is suspended or expelled, um, you know, even after all of these um, procedures happen. Um, so, yeah, so basically they, 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 there's a lot of process um, little actual accountability. So that, that led me to very much relate to this, um, this passage that I found from Sarah Ahmed on her website, The Feminist Killjoys, um, that she posted in January. And I mean, I just thought this was brilliant. She is like, making complaint can also require becoming an institutional plumber. It is because complaints often get stuck in the system. The planes end up about the system. 
On paper, it can seem as if making complaint is a rather linear process since these procedures are often re represented as flowcharts with paths and arrows, which give the would-be complainant a clear route through. And I was just like, going like, oh my God, like I was just looking at our flowchart here, here and, see, and see, seeing that. Um, you know, so this issue of these, these procedures as being kind of here, um, you know, a way of appearing to address a problem. So this is kind of a, the, what in the U.S. kind of context of institutional theory is, 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 um, subst is symbolic compliance. So this is a different, a different way of putting it. That, so she says, I love this, that re resolutions can be problems given new form. Um, listening to those who have made or tried to make formal complaints has taught me that the gap between what is supposed to happen and what does happen is densely populated. So this kind of goes to this, this, this issue that we were talking about last time that, you know, it's good to have, it's good to have some way of making a complaint a process, but simply having a process does not actually arrive at justice necessarily. Um, because as, as we saw, like in the University of Michigan context, the complaints just somehow go away as they move through the process. They, they're just kind of like, they're, you know, if they're, the, the block, they're, they're kind of blocked at, at various steps. So um, uh, Jennifer Fried, who's a psychologist who I had the pleasure of working with last year in California, um, she has come up with a concept which she refers to as institutional betrayal. That's like another way of, work, of talking about the sort of secondary victimization that occurs. Um, and so she, she talks about this as like the wrongdoings perpetrated by, um, you know, by an institution upon individuals dependent on that institution, including failure to prevent or respond, respond supportively to wrongdoings. So, so I mean, this is this has been you know very very um, kind of apt in terms of describing how particularly undergraduate women have experienced sexual assault on campus, um, particularly very privileged kind of white women who've had kind of basically nothing bad ever happened to them in their lives arriving on campus, being assaulted by a peer, turning to the university, and then experiencing shaming, um, being ignored, being insulted, um, being, um, having their cases kind of, uh, just take forever um, being told that they would get um, information by before Thanksgiving and not receiving the information until after Christmas. Just this, this kind of incredible sense of like, I, I had this trust in this institution and it was wrongly placed in the sense of the sense of the sense of betrayal because um, the, the institution failed to fail to respond in some kind of a supportive way. Um, and I think, you know, often the institutional betrayal is far deeper than, you know, than the undergraduates who experience harm realize because I didn't include this, this in a in, um, slide in a presentation, in the presentation, but there's, um, um, sometimes I include a passage from like an Ohio State administrator from like the 90s where he basically just says that we know that a certain amount of rape is happening and it's just collateral damage. It's just the cost of doing business that, that so, so institutions have understood for decades that this is, that this is actually a predictable and kind of n normal production. And in fact, I, uh, with um, Laura Hamilton, Brian Sweeney, this paper that we published in 2006 on sexual assault on campus, we kind of just described the organizational production of um, sexual assault on campus, the sort of predictable processes and organizational arrangements that kind of reliably produce this, um, you know, 20% of, um, of students experiencing this harm. So the institutional betray betrayal um, happens far before um, the, the response to the harm. It, 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 it's basically kind of, you know, as, as, as young women are filtered into the American university, they're basically being set up for this to happen to them. Um, but, now I'll switch and sort of conclude with kind of sort of like some hopeful notes about like, well, you know, how could this be responded to better? Um, Jennifer Fried comes up with this concept of institutional courage. And in fact, she's now created a center, a center for um, institutional courage. Um, and she has a website for it. I'm affiliated with this. But this is this is the kind of suggestions that she that she has in terms of 
you know, she, first she says, well, organizations should comply with the law, um, respond sensitively to victim disclosures, and then bear witness and be accountable and apologize. And so that I think is, organizations rarely do that. Just actually just flat out say, it happened, we're sorry, it shouldn't have happened, we will change, that was wrong. Um, there are some examples of organizations that have done that, um, but few. And it also means, she says, cherish the whistleblower. So protect people who come forward from retaliation. Expect retaliation, protect it. So that means, for example, if a first year assistant professor um, comes forward with a sexual harassment complaint, anticipate that that person's tenure process is going to need to be handled extremely delicately and everybody associated with the perpetrator is going to need to be removed from the case and that the, that the retaliation can happen five years down the road and it becomes the university responsibility to protect against that in a long-term way. Um, so she also says, engage in a self-study. That is actually know how much harm is occurring. And that, that's where, for example, the, the work that, that um, Heike presented last time, that, that's at, you know, in conducting the anonymous surveys, that this is, this is you know, really important step in terms of uh, eradicating this harm. Um, it's important um, that leadership it is on board, um, and often this means um, diversifying the leadership of organizations, getting more women and more diversity in leadership, transparency, and resources. Um, so, and on this too, in terms of because of the incredible difficulty of actually um, repairing the harm once it's occurred, the prevention, I think, is really key. Um, and this, um, I think, in the US, there have just been like seminar after seminar after seminar of, um, of like educational workshops. And this kind of individual level kind of approach is limited, I think, in how what it can accomplish. It's useful to change organizational structures, reduce the hierarchy, um, give, give perpetrators less of a chance to perpetrate, remove the opportunities. For example, in science, um, if one person, a super, super, like, you know, high power, usually man, who controls all of the money and all of the access into a career, that person that has this kind of monopoly on power that, you know, pr provides just enormous opportunities for abuse of that power. So trying to sort of anticipate where those opportunities to abuse power lie and Kind of reorganize the institution to remove those opportunities. Diversification and then um, basically kind of trying to sort of um, do gatekeeping at the front end requiring potential hires and students who are admitted to to potentially release prior disciplinary missing word there but kind of um, processes like there's in the U.S. there's um, a, a tremendous problem of the, what's colloquially turned to is kind of past the trash, whereas someone gets in trouble at one school and then that's all hush hush and confidential and then they get hired at another school and then they engage in harm. And this happens at the undergraduate level too, where like athletes are, are, are um, expelled from one school for, for rape and then another school enlists them on their athletic team. Um, the um, University of Oregon got in big trouble for knowingly um, recruiting um, sexual predators into their athletic programs. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, academics are very sensitive to money and status. And if, um, if in fact, um, civility broadly construed, but also in terms of participating in sexual harm is taken into account for promotion, tenure, and awards, it would probably um, reduce it, like it, 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 weave it into the stakes of the entire endeavor. And then, if, you know, formal in, um, the formal resolution processes, I mean, they, these, are, these are tough to make them, to make them work um, out well. Um, the, they should be transparent, they should be as simple as reasonable, of course they should be fair, and they should, the survivor should be able to control what's happening. And um, that's, these are 
difficult to arrive at, but those, this would be some kind of criteria for, for thinking about what, what kind of processes might, might work. And then given that um, people will continue to be harmed and formal resolutions won't always work, the amount of just supportive resources that um, schools can provide, I think, um, are important. Like um, when, when I was talking with Julia, she was talking about the issue of like what happens with when international students in the US context are, are harmed. And in the, the University of Michigan um, kind of booklet on resources, they indicate that they are well, well aware that, um, that uh, when when someone becomes a victim of a crime such as domestic violence or sexual misconduct that in fact that might raise issues about visa or immigration status and that and that those maybe have to be simultaneously worked through and that in, individuals who are international students or have visa issues or immigration issues might be more um, vulnerable more likely to receive retaliation more 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 afraid more um fearful about coming forward and so a kind of you know recognition that additional support that part of for example in the u.s supporting international students is anticipating um that um and providing resources to um to, to support in these kind of contexts so so the, this sort of diversity of resources that are that become necessary then are you know substantial lots of different each different person will have a different kind of set of concerns Okay, I think I'll go ahead and, and stop there. And so then I could, you know, take, take other, other questions that have accumulated. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Well, you have already answered some of the questions in your talk, but okay. I will just summarize what's left. Um, so a participant was asking about the procedures which you already went through, and we understand that they are very complex and complicated, but they mm -hmm. are asking if you would be kind enough to share any resources. If there's a web link, for instance, a web page, you can do that on the chat box later if you wish. And the second part of the question is, does the decision change if the harasser is a faculty member? So the, does the Leo of harassment have an influence on the decision is what the participant is asking. Does the, what, what's the, can does you repeat? Does the of harassment have an influence on the decision, you know, whether it's happened inside or outside the campus, if the harasser is a faculty member or not? Would that affect yeah. the decision that is made? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, the, they, the procedures are organized um, at most schools, definitely at University of Michigan, around um, the relationship of the um, basically the perpetrator or the accused person to the university. So um, if a student is accused, the student procedures apply. If a faculty member is, um, is accused, the faculty procedures apply, and they are a different set of procedures. One of the kind of bizarre things about the recent kind of Trump era um, kind of, you know, changes to all of this is there's going to be more similarity in how faculty, staff, and student cases are handled because it's kind of pushing, pushing a, a convergence to a more kind of adversarial process for everybody. But, um, but yes, the, the, for a faculty case, it would be, it would follow, it would follow roughly um, the same, um, Oh, can you just, I guess, this, yeah, that's fine. The, it would fo follow roughly the same um, kind of like investigation, like, you know, you make the complaint, you do the investigation. But um, one of the things that's different is that the, the bodies that are the decision makers and who's determining the sanctions would be different than for students. The student affairs people take over kind of managing um, student misbehavior. And the kind of the, the people who are in charge of um, kind of s sanctioning the faculty and that that can be a kind of diverse group of people like one of the one of one of the cases that came through Michigan recently was a faculty member was accused of title nine violations actually this was a woman professor in my own department um, she was accused of of um, inappropriate behavior with women students um, the case um, this is this is public. It's been in the newspapers and all that. So I'm not like revealing you know, whatever stuff that's not publicly available. But the 
the case, the case went forward. She was found um, not responsible for the Title IX violations, but the Dean of the Literature, Science, and Arts College looked at the kind of sum total of the behavior and thought that it was inappropriate and um, put some sanctions in place against her. She did not like the sanctions in place, so she hired one of these lawyers. Then there's this entire industry of lawyers now in the US who sue, who sue universities, particularly on the respondent side. So she found one of these folks to sue the university. She won her case in the sense that she won that, 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 um, that, um, there, that because she was not allowed to cross-examine her accusers, that there was due process violations and so she couldn't be held r responsible and so the dean was like kind of way you know over the top and kind of holding her responsible for anything um and the um that ended up it's also played into how these things have worked out because now this is consistent with the what the um federal level has decided that there needs to be um a he formal hearing with adversarial cross-examination. So in fact, what is happening in the US is I think of an institutionalization of retaliation. So you get, you can have full professor with um, fancy lawyer basically interrogating a first year undergraduate student who had the courage to come forward, who maybe that's where the, the need for the university for the sexual assault prevention and awareness to hire, in fact, prosecutors so that these generally lower status individuals and often less resourced individuals who are trying to bring forward um, cases. By, so by, by allowing more lawyers in the process and, and creating it in a kind of more adversarial kind of face-to-face cross-examination process, the US is moving towards um, a system where, um, well, retaliation will be institutionalized and it will be harder for for individuals to be found responsible of, of much of anything. So it's 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 a dicey it's a dicey time. But I hope that <laughs> I hope that kind of answered the question. Yeah. Uh, there are two connected questions, so I'll move on to them. One is uh, a participant is saying that it's their impression that policies on sexual harassment and gender violence in the U.S. are put in place when a specific case gets a lot of press coverage. And they gave as an example the Stanford rape case. So the question is, do you think that has always been the case in the U.S.? And would you agree that U.S. policies on sexual violence and are often not preventative but corrective in nature? And a second related question to what you were just talking about, I think, is whether there are any support centers in U.S. universities, for instance, support uh, when somebody has been harassed or support for trauma afterwards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think those are both really interesting questions. Um, I think that it is, it is the case that in the, the biggest picture, um, these policies are um, corrective, not preventative. And the, the Yale case in, from 1980 that I, that I pointed out, the, 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 the students filed a lawsuit and the result of the lawsuit, actually the 1980 lawsuit was that universities had to have policies. So in the first instance, um, the, the, the push, the, the harm occurred and then that put in place the requirement for procedures. But since that point forward, universities have been legally required to um, to have procedures to be perceived as in compliance. But that the the cycle of of like of of massive um, uh, media kind of you know massive crisis and then a re, uh, response by redoing all of those procedures has happened repetitively. For example, after Baylor was a case where. Um, many athletes were just, I mean, they were raping women right and left, as far as I could tell. It was super bad. The university was covering it up. Their, their procedures were abysmal. Um, it all got exposed. And then they had like fancy lawyers come in and redo all of their procedures. And kind of ironically, we were just coding Baylor's procedures. And it's, it's a religious school in Texas. I mean, it's not a progressive school. They have amazing 
interesting policies on paper now. I mean, they are beautiful. Um, so they, they, they did go and do um, a massive kind of corrective. Um, in the Stanford case, Stanford already had super fancy procedures in place before that, before the particular, the Brock Turner case. Um, Stanford, of course, is, is um, very, very kind of high end and kind of, you know, has all of the money to have all of the fanciest lawyers and procedures and have been. Um, so they, you know, they, I'm not sure how much they reworked stuff after, um, after that particular case. I do know, having been out there for a year last year and talking with the people that were the kind of institutional equity people there, that they have reformed their procedures in Con in relationship to particular lawsuits that they that were filed and they lost, then they they did in fact redo their procedures. And um, yes, I mean in terms of the support centers, yes, for example, at Michigan, the Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Center is really active, does all kinds of um, survivor advocacy. Um, and most big universities have such a center. Um, and um, these were centers, like the one at Michigan, was a result of feminist activism. I think um, right around the time when I was an undergraduate, actually, sort of uh, 80s, that that it was formed as a result of, of it was already already existed when I was when I was a student. Um, but it, it was a result of activism. But yeah, they. Um, and of course, the, the how how well funded these places are varies enormously. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's a question, well, an inquiry about whether you can suggest any studies that examine how students' success in academia is affected from campus sexual assault or harassment. Yes, I mean, there definitely are studies. Um, I would have to kind of hunt them down, but the studies um, reveal that um, it's terribly traumatic for student success. Um, students, um, students drop out of school um, at much higher rates. They lose, um, they lose coursework in the sense that, that of the particular semester that the assault occurred. Um, they um, have high rates of depression, anxiety, rates of suicide go up. Um, it's, um, sometimes there's cases where, where they have to, they feel like they need to drop out of extracurricular related programs um, that they, because their assailant is, is in that program as well, or um, they, um, they change a major to, to um, and, and move away from something they dearly love to do in order to avoid a perpetrator. Um, so yeah, there are, there are studies that very systematically document um, precisely the, um, the kind of the, the consequences for individuals when this happens. Thank I can try to put down if the, if that, if the, that was good. interesting. Thank you. Uh, so there's a question to you about what you think is the responsibility of the US education system in terms of changing the mentalities of especially men that leads to a pattern of harassment towards women, especially the peer harassment is what they're asking for. So, mm -hmm education system at large from you know uh, primary to higher education yeah well i think it's huge i mean i would love to see you know comprehensive sex education from a feminist perspective embodied in education from you know preschool through you know graduate school and of course that you know developmentally age appropriate but to um like i one of my students um that i share with karen martin looked at um, gender in preschools and showed that in American preschools, little boys are allowing, are being allowed to kind of in, violate the personal space of little girls, even at age three, you know, that they're, they're like tackling them and she's saying, no, I don't want to do that. And the preschool teachers are like, oh, boys will be boys, rough and tumble, like, and not, you know, not, um, not working with kids on sort of like, you know, bodily autonomy, like, and, and that, you know, boys can't do that. Um, so, I mean, I think there's ways to incorporate that kind of education in, um, in every level and that it absolutely should be. Um, Thank you. 
Well, there is a question about student athletes as perpetuators. You already mentioned that, but if you want to add something to that, uh, the participant is asking how colleges handle these cases when the harassers are student athletes. Often very badly. Um, student, student athletes have a high risk of perpetrating because um, um, this kind of connects to my sort of research in, in general, the, the, the research for paying for the party, that's, that in, in these American college cultures, there's often like very, very elaborate status hierarchies that are organized around race, gender, sexuality, fraternity status, athletic status, and often athletes are sort of, uh, particularly in like division one sports, are basically gods on American campuses. I mean, these, these, these folks are like incredibly revered. I, I myself taught a class on um, sexuality. Uh, I, it was like a, a class on hookups and relationships. And I had a fo I had a whole bunch of people from the football team in my class, and including this one guy who's now plays for the NFL, who was, I think, a sociopath, actually. I mean, really, I mean, and he, he had been involved in one of a very high, pro high profile Michigan sexual misconduct case and, and engaging in retaliation because it was his buddy that was the perpetrator. And I could not control that class. I mean, all of the kind of energy of the class was around kind of worshiping this guy. I mean, there was like, um, and he had been, he'd received media training. I mean, he was on like national television talking on ESPN, like, you know, every week. And so his ability to control the space, um, um, was just in, in you know intense and um, so 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 there's there's that so they're very they, there's a very high risk of perpetration and then the universities are often um, I think I don't think Michigan is bad in this case but in sometimes what they do and this was a case that this happened at Baylor and I think Notre Dame had issues with this too the universities like protect these individuals from the student misconduct processes that other other students had to go to like there's an instance in the in the in the movie the hunting ground talking about notre dame where after an assault occurred um basically the the police were in in you know everybody who needed to do the interviews were prevented from from interviewing the the kind of athletes who had who had who had committed this the assault and there's the hunting ground also talks about the Janius winston case at florida state where um, he, the, the evidence suggests in the New York Times did an investigation and pretty confirmed it. I mean, he violently raped this, this um, woman. And I mean, he's still playing in the NFL now. And I mean, it's basically an open secret. I mean, he's engaged in further uh, gender-based violence over the course of his career, but he's, he's, you know, he's a massive moneymaker. And that's, you know, it's the issue of like, of money versus <laughs> women's bodies and lives and so that um and the amount of retaliation that that woman who came forward at the florida state case experience was just extreme as as one might expect yeah uh, two questions about covid i think we can finish with that so, <laughs> <laughs> one is how was how does the COVID moment change policy making or implementation of prevalent policies in the US? And is another one is about how you talked about medicine being not being a very, very women friendly area. And the participant is asking, can we assume that women health professionals and workers are facing more, more sexual harassment these days in this process? Yeah, yeah, no, I think those are really, those are, those are really good. Um, questions. I mean, what, one, one thing in terms of the COVID business, it's um, feminists and universities, even the not feminist parts of universities, perceive that the fact that the Trump administration came out with these new regulations um, in the middle of the pandemic as a hostile attack, attack on the university. That because the um, work of trying to comply with these new policies is huge and universities now are struggling for, to figure out how they're going to kind of survive and manage this next year and to add this enormous kind of administration administrative burden at this time was perceived as a deliberate assault by some um and and i talked with karen williamson at, who's the director of the advocacy group here on campus the sexual assault prevention awareness center and she said that there are still cases being reported 
but that the nature of the cases has changed somewhat, that they're, that as one might predict, they're getting more intimate partner violence and domestic abuse type cases com coming through. And so that's something that I've been thinking with Lilia Cortino, my colleague, about too, that the, the, um, the fact that everybody is at home creates um, opportunities for different kinds of harm to be occurring. Um, and then there's all of the kind of ways that people can use like Zoom and you know, various kinds of digital forms of, of harassment that, that may be proliferating as well. So, um, and like kind of, an, kind of a, a very weird thing that happened here last week is that um, a number of men of color were publicly named on Twitter and at Michigan as assailants kind of a, a Twitter sort of digital sort of vigilantism kind of they were just kind of kind of outed and it's actually not clear whether the um, allegations are coming from actual women who were harmed or like when I saw how systematic and how many men of color were kind of being targeted, I immediately started to wonder if at least some of the allegations were in fact coming from white racists who were trying to smear and, um, you know, be, engage in reputational harm. So, so our, now our, our Office of Institutional Equity and Student Affairs and all of the lawyers are, are trying to sort that out on, you know, on top of, on top of everything else. And so I guess that what, what I would say is the sort of layered, the layered crises at the university or that the US is going through now, the pa pandemic, the um, kind of reckoning with our racist society and the, the protest that's occurring and the amount, and the amount of kind of harm based on racial bias that, that it is experienced and, and the kind of economic collapse that is occurring um, intensifies um, kind of kind of all of this all you know the 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 um, that people who are already vulnerable when crises happen they become more vulnerable um, and we've definitely seen that with the kind of race disparities in terms of the people um, dying of, of COVID but that that that's um, likely relates to sort of gender-based violence as, as well. Um, and then that, that also uh, relates to the issue of, the, of medicine. There's an enormous amount of um, sexual harassment and other forms of bias that occur in medicine from the patient to the provider, um, where the patient um, says things that are really racist or whatever. And so the um, the fact that our healthcare providers, and this is true around the world, are so intensely vulnerable now that they, they, um, there's the issue of the, the things that their employers are asking them to do and whether they are being able to kind of be safe. And then there's the question of like, of potential disrespect of, you know, patients coming in without masks or being, refusing to wear a mask or like, how do you deal with, with, um, how do you deal with the, the kind of potential disrespect that may or may not be identity based that that's happening and um and yeah so that's that i, I somebody described kind of covid as basically this this thing that does just puts pressure on and exposes the kind of weaknesses of every institution it's like it's sort of whatever problems were there before become magnified and highlighted so that's i think very much going on Thank you so much, Elizabeth. This was a very informative talk. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone is feeling the same. I can see, uh, you know, people's comments on the chat box. Yeah, I haven't even looked at the chat. I've just been listening to you too. You, you can look later. I think we can, we can save it and we can send it to you. You can see the comments okay. and some of the okay. questions that, you know, uh, that I had to combine <laughs> to save time. Okay. okay. Yeah, I would love to see all the questions. and. The question on the resources, like in the, in the Google Doc that I started, I did pull like uh, web links to all of the various Michigan resources and policies and you know, put them in that, in that, in that document as, as well. I don't know if I should pull them out and put them in the chat here or, um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you could, or you could send it to us, Elizabeth. We'll be in touch anyway. But we provided that email address. Remember, so that could be our, you know, sort of uh, way of collecting all these relevant documents. Okay. That would okay. be really great. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if there aren't any other further questions, I want to thank Elizabeth so much for an amazingly comprehensive and uh, fabulously interesting talk. We learned so much from you, and I think it gave us the opportunity to think about so many different dimensions of the issue. I have five million uh, questions, but I'm not going to, we're really out of time. Uh, I just wanted to say, I mean, I hope you'll follow the seminars and these webinars, and I hope we'll be able to continue talking about these issues mm -hmm. and um, if I, I see that so many people who've written um, in chat uh, want to continue this conversation so uh, for those of you who can spare the time we'll be uh, meeting again on June 24th so mm -hmm. in two weeks time Wednesday same time and this time we're shifting to the context of Israel as Arela Mazali uh, is going to uh, present to us and her um, uh, perspective is going to be quite interesting because she's a researcher, activist and writer uh, at the same time. I think she's going to weave these different uh, areas together. So please join us um, on the 24th as we continue this conversation. And if uh, anybody would like to contribute, uh, I wrote this uh, under chat as well, if anybody would like to send us uh, the MA theses that they've written or uh, articles and books that they think would be of interest, I think we are going to uh, collect uh, these resources and make an archive. Uh, so please do so. Thank you so much. I would just like to ask Elizabeth, Heike, the Sue Gender team to remain. And uh, I hope to see all of you in two weeks. Thank you.